plus one forward, the podcast powered by the apocalypse, where we talk about tabletop role-playing games using or inspired by the apocalypse engine. I'm your MC Rich, and I'm joined by my guest, Fraser Simons of Sam Joko Publishing. Hey, Fraser, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. It's an honor to be here. I've been listening since the very beginning. The very beginning, which is like dozen plus ish episodes ago. <laughs> well, I was still there. <laughs> I've had you earmarked to get you on here, Fraser. Just waiting for the veil to come out, and so excited that it's now out, so we can talk about it. So that's cool. All right, let's kick it off with the standard question: How long have you been playing PBTA games, and what was your gateway? I think it's got to be three or four years ago. I remember the gateway was my brother actually got me the Dungeon World, which you might call it, the soft cover that was actually the first one from the Kickstarter. So I have like the the bits that came with the Kickstarter, the small little books, the Planner Codex. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very cool. And all of the extras there. And then he ran a one on one session for me before he flew back to Korea. And that was that was really uh, draw dropping for me because that was not only the first experience with PBTA, but that was the first experience back into the hobby at all since we were like 10. What? Yeah. So, wow. That is a big break. Yeah. So we went from AD&D when my character was named Ben and I had a horse named Ben the Great <laughs> to, <laughs> to Dungeon World where I was actually, don't tell Jason this, but I was a bard. <laughs> so, oh, a bard. Yeah. That's awesome. And I think I had uh, like... So did you cast spells and play music? I wasn't... Uh, I think we did have a scene where I was in a battle, but most of it was me trying to figure out this weird puzzle or something like that that was in the dungeon and i used my magic to bring it out and break the and solve the puzzle and then i remember i was like making a way across like a chasm and that's when like a, a bell rogish thing sort of like attacked me oh, and i nice. remember make your way across the cat was this a bridge over a chasm perhaps and the balrog came and exactly yeah i think so i think that's how i remember it anyway it could be skewed <laughs> i now. remember it that way too <laughs> yeah watch it watch it was like a goblin and i was like it was a balrog <laughs> but uh something happened and it was good and i remember the jaw-dropping moment for me was when uh i was in I believe I was an elf, and he was like, okay, well, you tell me what uh, elves are like. And I was like, well, <laughs> what do you mean, right? Like, uh, I don't have, like, a manual around. He's like, no, you're the elf. You tell me what an elf is like. Can they see in the dark? And I was like, oh, yeah, we can see in the dark. <laughs> Probably because it benefited at me at the time because I was in a, you know, a dark dungeon. But uh, slowly he kept teasing more information from elven lore out of me and stuff as we were going and it just sort of blew my mind but then after that uh he left right flew to korea and i had no one to play with so then i started going to DD encounters and i was like well i guess this is okay <laughs> poor guy <laughs> yeah so i had to wait a while really basically every year when he flew back for christmas that's when i got my pbta fix until i started gaming online so all right awesome let's uh, jump over here and read a sitch all right mm -hmm. read a sitch Okay, Fraser, I asked you what you wanted to talk about in Rita Sitch, and you have this idea, some way that you make NPCs that is fascinating. All right, hit me with this. How is it that you often make NPCs for games that you, that you run? So uh, I collect vinyl as a hobby, and I know a lot of people, in when they're playing, they're constantly making NPCs based on uh, characters that they see on TV and stuff, but I I don't, mm -hmm. at the time anyway, uh, I didn't watch a lot of TV and movies. So for me, I uh, started making NPCs based off of particular songs that I liked, especially when I was buying a lot of new vinyl. And for me, it just really clicks in my head because uh, it, the feeling of that NPC is for forever there. And if we ever take like a break for a couple weeks or whatever, uh, if I make an NPC that is like JJ, Grey, and Mafro, the sun is shining down, all I have to do is listen to that song, and I know exactly what that NPC is like. And usually I've chosen it because some of the words within that song uh, resonate with the NPC themselves. That's exactly what I was going to ask. So the lyrics inform the 
the play style or like, like, give me a rundown like let's go with a song and then what kind of character have you created from it? I'm, I'm really excited to hear this i think the first one i did was beast by nico vega a lot of people know that song because it was the trailer for bioshock infinite you know when Ooh, okay. the, that like hard-hitting sort of revolution type song the lyric is uh, stand tall for the beast of america lay down like a naked dead body Keep it real for the people working overtime. They can't stay living off the government's dime. So that NPC was very, like, uh, forceful. It was a, a woman, and I, I, not very creatively I named her Nico, because <laughs> <laughs> it's by Nico Vega, but uh, most people didn't know that at the time, so it worked out very well for me. <laughs> And, Good job being obscure. <laughs> yeah, and she she was the one that was giving them their their jobs at the time. Yeah, she she just wouldn't take any nonsense from people. Uh, she only gave jobs that would like surmount the status quo. As soon as I made her, I made her a threat uh, in the game because she was just that like vibrant and in, of intensity in the in the fiction right away. And then I started doing that for all NPCs, and a lot of them become so clear in the fiction that they do become threats. But other otherwise, yeah, they're they're just kind of like fun. But a lot of times, I also get like a little bit of pleasure just from like my own little jokes when I make like a a guy's wife fr- follow you into the dark or something, and then I start start telling actual song lyrics from it i get like this weird (laughs) like sense of pleasure you know especially because that campaign when i specifically did that was one of the ones where we did the veil and they were actually going into uh this person's mind to Mm -hmm. fix something there and it all became like a dreamlike state so at the time by the time that guy figured out what i was doing he wasn't sure if I was signaling him if the dream was like not real because he was recognizing these this person was saying lyrics to him all the time within the veil and stuff so it became very like wow awesome and and messed up for him and uh it it was a really enjoyable campaign it was the longest running campaign uh for the playtest of the veil it led right up to the kickstarter so do you listen to just random music in preparation for a game or like how would you pull a song out when you're in the middle of a game because you know a lot of times they'll say oh well i want to go over to the left oh well this is unexplored territory let's just go there and you meet a so-and-so character are you pulling from music you normally listen to or how, how do you prep that it would be yeah i always like if i'm writing which is almost every day now um i'll be listening to vinyl and it's usually pretty eclectic like when i write playbooks i'll have like common and nas on and then when i write like actual fiction stuff i'll have like jazz and and stuff on but normally i'll pick uh like prep it kind of by a watching the um anime or reading the book uh, or the TV show, movie, whatever of the cyberpunk thing that I want to do. Mm-hmm. And then for the tone of that game, based on the thing that I've consumed, I select an album and listen to it. And then usually I'll write down a couple of those things and those will be the, become the NPCs of it. So for, nice. for Beast, for example, uh, like the Beast of America for Nico Vega, that was a very, uh, like usurp the government campaign so it it stuck well with it and then the other songs um just the way that you mix a cd it's good for the tone of a game because uh when you're listening to it it increases and and goes down and mixes up and mixes down so it sort of feels like a story beat ingrained in the vinyl already anyway if that makes sense because it It'll, whenever a song is really powerful, usually the next one will be like a, a lower key one and then they'll bring it up again and bring it down and, and stuff like that. So uh, the vinyl itself is telling a story and I just sort of use it to pick the tone of the game usually. Really? So you'll chart out like if there are 
10 songs on this album, those are the next 10 people that we could potentially meet in your game? Yeah, until things change, right? Until the sure. PCs intervene and or if the PCs don't like that tone from the first session and we change stuff up. But uh, yeah, usually it's a thing that I do to instill a little bit of confidence in myself and the fiction going forward because I'll, I'll know what's literally playing kind of next wow that's really cool that's awesome all right well you mentioned the veil a few times i'm really interested to learn a bit more about this game that you've got you want to open our brain to it sure fantastic open your brain fraser this game the veil all right this is this is some kind of gauzy curtain game is that what we're playing here <laughs> yeah you got is this me. a marriage game is that is this what this is well, the the funny thing is, is I thought it was like super clever until I, we did the Kickstarter, and then I I was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna Google my own game and see what comes up or whatever, and then of course like a billion other things came <laughs> up, and my game did not. <laughs> so, oh man, yeah. So I was like, Your okay, SEO so was a fail, huh? Yeah. Okay, so other cool. people obviously have thought <laughs> of this, especially since there's actually a PBTA game that uh, like wasn't produced before it or whatever but it actually there is a pbta game called the veil already by the time i launched it so wow okay all right yeah <laughs> well what is your game about what's the setting and, and what's it about so it's a, a cyberpunk game and it's built from the ground up to allow people to create their own kind of cyberpunk but there is some stuff about the fiction that's ingrained in it. Just like uh, vanilla PBTA, you have playbooks that kind of tell you what's going on in the fiction already. And what's sort of already stated is that everybody in, has a Nero chip in their head, which has like permanently connected them to an internet-like thing that also is a hybrid reality. So you can see what virtual space is, as well as what normal space is, and they've come together or bled together depending on what kind of campaign you play to yeah let you see the future basically so it's got um futuristic weapons and neurochips and all that kind of stuff but then everybody as they choose their playbooks are essentially in choosing the ingredients of the game that you're eventually going to play so the playbooks very much are all very unique and have their own tropes built into it and all that kind of stuff. So by taking the stuff that we know about the setting and then putting playbooks onto it, we create something, you know, hopefully completely new for the players and the MC alike. Tell me a bit more about the mechanics. What's different about the veil versus, say, Apocalypse World or Granddaddy? Quite a bit of stuff. For XP... So you've got um, beliefs, and then you've got the, the Dungeon World fail to get XP thing coupled together, uh, which fits nicely with the genre, I think, because it's always, uh, well, the good cyberpunk fiction in, in my book, anyway, is always very personable uh, tales about specific people and zoomed in on their lives. And then mm -hmm. they always get their asses handed to them and become a lot better once they uh, oh yeah get the... Uh, XP. So, like, I think the difference between uh, T1 and T2 for Sarah Connor is she got XP from Dungeon World and learned from her mistakes. <laughs> 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 right? She became quite the badass. <laughs> oh, yeah. That is cool. Another thing is uh, states versus stats, of course. So, instead of rolling a stat, you're rolling a state, which is the uh, emotion that the person is feeling when they enter uh, a scene and trigger a move. Okay. Anytime a move is triggered, it could be a wide range of things that you're rolling with. Mad, sad, scared, joyful, and uh, a bunch of other ones. And that way you're kind of like contextualizing every single time a move triggers Okay. with what uh, we're seeing on the screen for the character. Okay, so you're saying that you could be engaging this the same move, which has results... But the plus or minus is based off of the emotional state as you engage within that move? Yeah, yeah. So let's say um, you're giving somebody an ultimatum. Um, when you trigger that move, you'll be looking at how your character feels. And 
every way that you feel has a modifier to it and you roll with that modifier. So that way, when they say what they do, uh, we also see that they're scared or, or they're happy or they're you know, anxious or, or whatever. And uh, I think it makes a much clearer fiction for, for everybody at the table that way. How often do people change states within, say, a fight? It depends. Usually within a fight, uh, well, Apocalypse World deals with uh, fights pretty quickly anyway. Like, you're probably only going to do, like, max two rolls to resolve a fight. But if it true, was true. To, to keep going, uh, people can always give whatever context they like to roll with a different state. But uh, they, they still have to give you the, the carrot in order for you to accept it as the MC. So, for instance, if you're doing a combat where you're helping out and you're sniping somebody, you could at first say that you uh, were really mad or... or uh, even scared or something like that, and you miss the shot. Mm -hmm. But then when you rolled again, you could say, you know, I think about how this person trained me, and um, I flash back to, you know, them training me, and smooth is fast, fast is smooth kind of thing from, like, that shooter movie. And now I'm rolling mm -hmm. with peaceful, because that's what I am. So as long as they give you that uh, that little nugget of fiction then I say that they can, you know, pretty much do whatever they want as long as the fiction is making sense as, as we go. Okay, cool. I get that. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite move and why? Favorite move? Uh, probably the Abyss Stairs Back move from the apparatus, which is pretty much exactly Ghost in the Shell. And uh, <laughs> yeah, like I would say this playbook sort of inspired the rest of the game because I was watching Ghost in the Shell and I was like I just I just really want there to be an RPG where this this thing is happening right <laughs> so there wasn't one that I made it myself and the Abyss Stairs Back is all about um, the apparatus getting humanity by witnessing things that are happening in their day-to-day -day life and observing uh, people so it's sort of like that uh, that show Humans, where the everyday acts of uh, what people do is what are making the androids in that show more uh, endeared to, to humanity and learning about them. Except that in this game, when you take that um, humanity that you gain when you do that, mm -hmm. you can also uh, unlock more states, because at the beginning you only have one state as the apparatus and uh, you're only able to unlock them by observing the things around you and learning about uh, other people. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Wow. That is really cool. Yeah. So initially you can just be like, you know, I, I saw like a really human moment or a really terrible moment too. Like a lot of times the apparatus, the first thing that they do is like, I want to hook into the internet and learn about humanity. And usually it's, not the best stuff that they learn, right? And when they see that stuff, they still get the humanity, but then they can choose to trigger their second move, which is rise. And when they rise, it means that they take that humanity and try to become something more than they once were. Or they can just use it to, to get advantage in a situation or um, do some other stuff. But it's always their choice if they want to make that moment um something that makes them rise above what they were before or not. So I, I really like it a lot. It's always like a a choice, but it's a, a like a cascading effect from normal events in the fiction. How often do people choose the, uh, the apparatus as a playbook within a group? Mm, I would say it depends how comfortable they are with PBTA, because it is probably the most daunting one when you look at it. There's a lot of stuff going on with that playbook. Uh, if people are really comfortable with PBTA and they have Ghost in the Shell as a touchstone, there's always somebody mm -hmm. in the in the group that'll pick it. But if it's a bunch of new people, they'll never, ever pick it. Interesting. Okay, cool. Okay, Frazier, I think I think it's time to get this to the table. Would you Would you mind if we act under fire and you show me a little bit of the veil? Sounds great. It is time to act under fire. Okay, in the veil, I am interested in playing plus zero one. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Uh, do you want me to pick a playbook or, or what do you want to do to set this up? It depends what kind of uh, fiction that you want. If you want it to be more about like states, then you probably don't need to pick a playbook. But some of the playbook moves are pretty cool. So you might want to be using them. Well, we're going to do just a single scene. So let's let's go ahead and go playbookless. We'll try to deal with the states and the basic moves. Is that cool? Sure. Can we make that work? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Awesome. Okay, let's see. Yeah, we're we're going to use the the Gauntlet City next thing that we've we've been doing, right? Which is All right. All the hard work that Rich has been doing on his Gauntlet City uh, Tuesday channels. I was just like, <laughs> how about we take all of that work and we extrapolate it into the, the future? I love it. It's Gauntlet City, and it's a uh, X amount of time in the future. You've got a neurochip in your head. What does your, what does plus zero one look like in the future? Oh, plus zero one has had a significant amount of their body remade, so they look Let's just go with Bateau. I'm just going to wear it on my sleeve. Okay. Man. He looks very much like Bateau, uh, meaning that he has the cybernetic eye replacement that look like mirror shades. And he's kind of a big, beefy individual uh, with this. Thank God he doesn't have the mullet because uh, that's not Bateau. So he has this uh, frosted blonde kind of crew cut going on. He's, he's a merc. So... <laughs> Yeah, but Bateau is definitely the uh, one of the cooler characters I think that has ever been in cyberpunk fiction. So I, I wouldn't, uh, yep. I wouldn't uh, put it past anyone to pick him. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. So are you still kind of Bateau guy in that like you're an infiltrator kind of guy? Yeah, I think so. I think okay, so. cool. In this uh, in this city, which I'm I, I'm totally picturing, it's sort of like a updated Blade Runner, right? <laughs> like nice. Blade Runner was was very good at its time, but now we have the the technology to make it look very cool. <laughs> and as in most cyberpunk, of course, it's dark. It's raining. There's neon signs everywhere, and I think that the the signs for all the places that you're seeing are uh, multiple different languages. Like, uh, you know, there's some in Chinese, there's some in Spanish, there's some in Japanese, because in this time period, language is kind of all like mixed together to, to make a, you know, fluid sort of language. And nice. as you're walking down uh, this street with a few cars lifting into the air vertically, with the, the cool gas jets flipping into the, <laughs> to the night air with the rain, you reach your your destination, which I think is like a a big noodle shop. Yes, and you've probably be coming to this noodle shop uh, forever, right? Like you know, you know the owner, you know all the the customers, and I think the this going to this noodle shop is really advantageous for you because you've been assigned to to stake out the the building right behind you. Right, so you can get a nice. little snackaroo in while you're uh, checking out this building, and I think as you do that, we could be analyzing this situation for um, this building behind you. So I'm analyzing. That's one of our moves, and I need to figure out what is my what's my current state. I think right now I'm feeling peaceful. Uh, I'm sitting here eating my favorite noodle. I've got it in a bowl, right? And uh, let's say that maybe I drop like a little camera drone just outside. So I'm watching that on my HUD and I've got a pair of chopsticks and I'm kind of scooping the noodles into my mouth as I go. So uh, we'll say that. Are you okay if I have a plus one on uh, Peaceful? It sounds like you always have a plus one, Rich. It sounds like it. <laughs> Definitely. Now I pull that off. Thank goodness, because that's a seven. Whew. Squeak. Awesome. All right. On a seven to nine, I get to ask two questions. Uh, what's my best way in? Let's go ahead. Yeah, let's, let's get that one. And I'll ask the follow up based off the information there. Best way in? Cool. So you've got your enhanced eyes, right? So I think you take like a few meandering looks at, the, at this building and suddenly in your perspective, since everything is in the virtual, right? It sort of like strips out this building into like grids 
probably neon grids or something like that. And as the nice. we see like a progress bar go from like zero to a hundred percent, and then a couple infrared uh, signals with uh, bodies walking around upstairs, and then it starts to deconstruct all the frame, and it makes like a sort of. If you ever played that game, uh, Fables, where it has the footprints <laughs> where you should go, it makes that kind of thing in your, in <laughs> nice. your HUD, right? And what it is, is it's saying that if your, your target is to go up and break into the, the building or get to where these two infrared bodies are, there's like okay. a, a skylight up top that, uh, would prevent, like, uh, be the best place in kind of thing. Cool. That makes sense. So I need to come in from up top. I like it. How are those two figures vulnerable to me? That's a good question. They're vulnerable in that uh, they, two things, they don't know that they're being watched. You'll have the advantage from being up top. And also, they're uh, busy. They're, um, well, busy, but not moving. They're hooked into what looks to be like a silver canister that has like a rotating cylinder up top. um, And it just keeps rotating faster and faster. And there's like a cords that are snaked into their, their veins. And you, you've seen this before, actually, this is a new street drug called um, liquid. And what it does is it injects them with like an even more stronger connection to the veil, right? Where they're, where they are completely leaving behind this hybrid reality to go completely virtual. It's kind of like, oh, um, wow. the metaverse for like Snow Crash or something where he's completely leaving the physical behind. And they've got like these weird sort of like heads up display things on them and they're slack, uh, jawed and they have like, you know, pot bellies with beer uh, all around them and stuff. And they're, they're just, whatever they're doing, it's uh, completely mesmerized them. And they're not, uh, you know, expecting visitors. Okay. Now, this is infiltration. Am I supposed to take something that they have? Or am I infiltrating to take care of them? What am I after? Um, I think, let's say that you're after that, uh, that cylinder. Yeah, I think this would be neat. That cylinder with the, the head that's rotating, it's good for like X amount of time of this drug. And what happens once this is done, um, it just sort of like shorts out and burns itself out like Mission Impossible after you saw the, the mission, right? So mm-hmm. this is, um, you, you've had a lead where you can go there and take out, a these guys uh, hopefully in time to actually recover the cylinder before it blows. And then you can get this back to your, your team and try to, you know, get a a reverse engineer, uh, a thing for the drug or whatever your team wants to do with it. Sounds cool. So liquid delivery system is what I'm after. That sounds good. I'll finish up my bowl of noodles. I know that I only have so much time, a little bit of a a countdown clock going for me as it were. Exactly. uh, Leave the noodle there along with, uh, you know, a few extra new yen as a tip. I like the waitress. And then we'll head back out. I reach up and grab the camera drone, stuff it back into my pocket, and I'll try to make my way up to the top and uh, come down from there. Cool. Um, yeah. Um, you have... If you're if you're Bato, you have lots of cybernetic enhancements and stuff, right? I so do indeed. I'm picturing... You know, a bateau-looking guy just, like, jumping straight up onto the fire escape, like, super noiselessly landing like a, a cat, and then jumping straight up onto the roof kind of thing. And you're- oh, yeah, yeah. That sounds cool. Except maybe, like, he lands his bateau, right? So there's a little bit of a give in there because he's such he's a huge metallic body. They, he's got a lot of extra weight he's carrying around, almost like Wolverine kind of thing. And then the second jump up and over, that sounds awesome. And you've got the dust plume, because it's anime, right? <laughs> yes, dust plume! <laughs> yeah. So you walk over to the, the skylight, and there's, um, whatchamacallit, it's one of those ones where it has a small little opening that you can open, but it's probably, like, really old and squeaky and stuff. Mm-hmm. And these these two guys are just laying there, and supposedly unaware, but you can bet 
that they might have, you know, set up something. Yeah, they're yeah, not idiots. You, you, this feel is it, some... you feel it in your gut, right? That you're like, this is this is too easy. We've never been able to get a copy of this drug. And these two guys are just there for the taking, right? There's got to be more to this. So what do you do? I would have hunkered down, looking down into the skylight, and then move around and try to check a, a full 360 view inside there uh, and, and analyze the scene. I want to see if there's something else hidden. Perfect. I feel like uh, at this point I'm a little bit nervous because I've got this time factor here. So um, I would say that, I hate to admit it, but I'm probably just a little bit scared of, of hosing this, so that's coloring me. And you know what? We'll say that I've got flat on scared. I'm not so great at scared. I'm oh, a okay. <laughs> oh, I rolled an eight. All right. And uh, with that Two. and analyze, I get a couple questions still. So what if anything appears out of place? Yeah. As you're you're sort of scanning around, you see that there's like another, whatchamacallit, it, it looks like a little like sprinkler thing, except it's got like a little lens on it. And what it's doing, you can tell is actually spraying, uh, spraying like 3D environment over them to make oh. it look like this is what's happening. As you're like rotating around, the way that you see this is I think there's some errant bit of light from the, the street pouring in. And just when you move, it like causes it to flicker a little bit, like a like a projector mm. hitting light, right? Cool. Okay. What's my enemy's true position? The true position, it'll be as you as you're checking out this uh, this thing, right? You look into it, and we see like the little progress bar again, and it traces back the the wiring to like a, a physical backup power unit that is on the side of the house that nobody would notice kind of thing. So in order for you to guess the the true position of these guys, you'll first have to take out your quote unquote true enemy of getting rid of this pro projector who's, you know, clearly skewing your vision a little bit. Gotcha. Uh, you said this is an old skylight, so I could probably shoot right through it. So I'm going to pull up a little... Uh, flechette arms submachine gun <laughs> and spray just take a little aim and spray uh with a laser sight and take a shot okay and you're doing this like uh like a silent like ninja type yeah, thing yeah, right yeah i've got like, a suppressor on it's there. not yeah okay so i think that would be taking a, a risk and the risk is that you miss and probably alert um, something in the room okay cool yeah, I think that um, I, I squeeze and I calm myself down, take a breath. This is something I'm used to. So I'm going to feel I'm feeling powerful right now as I uh, have the drop on these guys, even though they've got their little security measures. I think I'm going to be all right. So I'm going to say that's a plus one on that state as well. And we and probably that is a nine. We probably see you like grin a little bit, too. Right. This is like your your thing. Right. It's like, yeah, it's now the game thing. is on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, cool. So at uh, risk, I got an, uh, roll the nine, an eight plus one, a nine. Yeah, so you take out the, the lens, and we see that these guys are actually not, uh, like, the, the beer and uh, the, the mm -hmm. American guts that are bulging out kind of, like, fade away. And these guys still are definitely um, in the same-ish positions but not exactly where they were so if you know someone had shot them they would be hitting the couch and not them gotcha, gotcha. um and cool. they're they're a little bit more uh nicer looking <laughs> we'll say that the, <laughs> that just uh, splayed out and not quite kind the of... chumps that i was led to believe huh okay exactly yeah but the the complication is that when that uh lens hits is you can see like a little automated uh, like if this was Metal Gear Solid, you see like the exclamation mark go up. So these guys oh. start like um, being a little bit wary, but they're not like completely aware of the the danger okay. as yet. Okay. So they're starting to come out of it. If only I had a crate, um, yeah. I could hide behind the crate, and it's just a box, and I'd be okay. But I don't. So <laughs> I've already shot a hole in the skylight. I'm just gonna dive down through it, right? And coming down, 
gun. I don't plan on killing these guys unless I have to. I'm really just after the canister. So that's my plan is to basically snatch it before they become fully aware and try to get the heck out of Dodge. Okay. Well, I think that would just be another risk. And the, the risk, right, is that you don't do this fast enough for them to, you know, get out of their, uh, like, jack out of their state and they come for you type thing. All right, cool. I think this is really exciting and i'm saying it's a little bit joyful i'm gonna say i'm batellish right so i'm probably <laughs> just flat on being joyful so i'll just go with a flat but you know what i'm minus one on being joyful if i'm truly batellish <laughs> i am not joyful at all so it's a minus one on joyful here we go okay. oh my goodness i just talked myself into a miss <laughs> so <laughs> it's a seven minus one is a six what you hit me with your xp and your best shot yeah so you get the xp for sure what is it that um you're going for exactly like are you are you just trying to go for the canister and detach these uh these yep. little things and leave them leave them hanging right just snatch them out of it and let them be lost in uh in the veil for a little bit that was the plan is do it so quick that i'm going to ruin their chance to react and, and come out okay so i think you you get a hold of this thing and you've got it like pressed to your your chest kind of thing as you're making your way from them when Mm -hmm. one of the guys uh takes a shot at you right and he hits you in your shoulder you take two harm i think oh i think that toe probably has at least one armor though like at least one armor yeah yeah. i agree all right so i take i take a harm Mm -hmm. pass straight through there is no harm move in this right uh no there's no harm move uh just eat it Okay. <laughs> yeah, but I continue to narrate, <laughs> which is oh, as, as bad. Going. It's as bad as the harm move, basically. But I think what happens is uh, when you're struck in the shoulder, it spins you and you crash uh, outside of a window, and now you're falling from this place, right? So what do you what do you do? We get the the point of view shot of the camera looking down at you as you're careening through this window in slow motion as the shards break. Like uh oh, that's so cool. Like the scene uh, in Dread with Bebop the slow mo. That, that scares me a little bit because, um, yeah, I think what would Beto do? WWBD. Exactly. Uh, I, I'm gonna see if there if there is there a. So we had on this building. I know that uh, I was not going out the side with a fire escape. There, maybe there's some gutter or an overhang or something I can grab onto so that I don't go down what four flights of, uh, here and, and hit the ground hard. Sure, yeah, there's a there's numerous uh, gutters and ledges. Like maybe what it is is it's like an old uh, brownstone or whatever, and each window has that like jutting ledge. And as you're oh, falling, cool. you're like okay. trying to grab one of these things. And that's awesome. that's another risk, I think. And the risk is that you um, will fall. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm fearful here. So, uh, again, uh, I will be in the state of scared, um, which I'd said was flat. So here we go. Oh, that's Whoa, an 11. You kill Aha. it. So you tell me what happens. Oh, yes. He, he still has the canister in his left arm. He grabs and his fingers almost slip off of the edge. Uh, then it, it, it starts to crumble, but he... He pulls himself up and then grabs onto all the way around and, and starts basically muscling himself up and, and pulls up to the the ledge there. And now he can make his way out. Cool. I think that they're far above you and they saw you go out the window. So you, we'll cut a little bit into the future where you're like back in your speedy car. I can't remember what exactly it was, right? But in Ghost in the Shell, he has that really fast car and he doesn't let anybody like mess with it or touch it. No, not at all. Yeah, so we'll say that you're back in there and you're with the canister, but you know that uh, it it only spins for a limited amount of time. So you've probably prepared something already to deal with this problem. What is it? Oh, well, I've got a device that basically puts it in a, in a stasis, like a hold uh, state, so that it still thinks that the, the countdown timer has been paused. And, and so, yeah, that's it. It's basically just like a pause button, right? And on my techie, he, he came up with this cool little pause button type deal that's supposed to freeze it and lock it down. Cool. I think that would be a, a good place to cut then, right? Like you put the cool. this device on it and it you know, has like this uh, EMP like thing that runs through it and it, and it stops. And then we see you like 
driving recklessly and crazily off the streets of yeah. New, New Tokyo. <laughs> I love it. All right. That is awesome. Frazier, thank you so much for coming on Plus One Forward and sharing with me the veil. I really appreciate having you on. Thanks a lot for having me. Plus One Forward is a production of the Gauntlet community and Richard Rogers. You can find us on gauntlet-rpg.com or follow us on Twitter at gauntletrpg. The games mentioned on this show use the Apocalypse Engine, which is a creation of Vincent and McGay Baker. The music for Plus One Forward is from the Savage Oral Hotbed CD Gomi Daiko. The songs used are Gomi Daiko Metal Version and Process. You can find more amazing tunes by Savage Oral Hotbed on their website, savagearlhotbed.com. <laughs>